in a inert atmosphere in our chemical box, and then we place it in an oven at around 600, 700 degrees Celsius for two hours and allow it to react. Afterwards, we cool it off and um, wash the product with water to dissolve all the salts, and then we wash it with a dilute acid to get rid of the magnesium oxide that is produced, and then hopefully being left with a pure psilocybin. So this process, um, after the last couple months, we've been fine-tuning it. We've actually been able to successfully produce a number of desired products through this method, which is great. Uh, so uh, for example here, I have um, one of the ones we've studied the most, this manganese 4 sil silicon 7 is called uh, HMS, or higher manganese silicide. That's a thermoelectric material, like I talked about earlier. Um, so this reaction here is uh, the optimal reaction to produce the product. So this is just some data from our uh, reactions. And what this is representing is these pieces show what uh, essentially the characteristic of the materials that we produce. And these blue peaks on the bottom are a uh, computational computer program that tell us theoretically if we have uh, the given material, what peaks we should exceed. So you can see in both cases there's exact matches, so we know we have the material that we want, which is great. Um, however, when we do this reaction, we actually do not get pure HMS. We get a mixture of products that's HMS and then another psilocyte involving manganese called uh, that's just a one-to-one, -one, manganese one, silicon one. Uh, I have that up here, this is the corresponding peak. And we found that we can't really get rid of it. It's always going to be there, no matter how much we uh, optimize the process. You can, uh, by using a one-to-two ratio of like, manganese into silica, we can actually uh, maximize the HMS production and minimize this uh, minosilicide, however, we can't get rid of it. And uh, we wanted a pure product. So we found that by taking that product from the first reaction and re-reacting it with a little more silica and magnesium, we could force it to complete, uh, force it to the desired phase, and essentially be left with only HMS, the product that we want. So it's great work. Uh, what's really cool about this is that uh, we can extend this result not only to HMS, but a whole number of other materials. Uh, so just by varying the starting conditions, we can produce different psilocytes. Uh, for example, here, just using manganese as a uh, starting material, and then if I go back, varying the amounts of magnesium, manganese oxide, and silica, we can produce three different psilocyte products, the HMS, the minosilicide, and the five to three psilocyte phase. Um, and we can get them up here, which is really cool. Only the HMS is interesting from a technological aspect, but it's just cool that we can make the other ones using this process. It's a process that's never really been done before. And we can also make other metal psilocytes, for example, iron psilocyte, by doing this process. So let's talk about some of the uh, advantages of what we've worked on. Um, so if we go back just real quick um, to this, the old method of producing, or not necessarily the old method, but the way you would do it previously, involved this lengthy refinement step that involved high temperature and ended up with a low on product. Our uh, method that we were working on uh, accomplished it as a much lower temperature, around 650 degrees Celsius. That's about 1,000 degrees cooler. Lower temperatures, that's a lot lower energy. And then in one to two hours, it's really easy, it's quick. Um, and it accomplishes it in only two steps instead of the whole refinement process. So all of these uh, factors combined to really increase the sustainability of this process compared to previous methods. Um, and then another great thing about this method is that it's scalable. Uh, I mentioned earlier that when you go through that whole refinement process, uh, you don't end up with a lot of product, which makes it not economically viable to use. Uh, you can imagine if you don't actually use psilocytes in a real world environment, you need to be able to make a lot of them. Uh, and ideally, our uh, process seems to be scalable, that we can upscale it and make larger amounts. Um, that being said, we still have some disadvantages to this approach. If right now, the reaction needs magnesium to reduce the oxides. And as far as materials go, magnesium is very good from a sustainability outlook. It's rather expensive and costly to produce. However, taking that into account, this method is still better than uh, anything that's been done before overall. So just 
to wrap everything up, um, we have successfully developed this new process that involves uh, producing the silicide by reduction of a metal oxide and silica by magnesium in a molten salt solvent. Uh, this is a more sustainable process than previous processes because it occurs at a lower temperature uh, in a short amount of time and accomplishes the synthesis directly. Um, so yeah, in the future, we still have a few things to do. We'd like to take our product that we've had and press it into a pellet and then measure the uh, properties, more or less, of our uh, products. Because you can imagine if uh, they should, like theoretically, these materials have these applications, but we have to actually determine if they're going to be useful or not. And then we want to take magnesium out of the equation altogether and try to accomplish their reduction just using, instead of uh, magnesium, passing a current through it and then do it electrochemically. And that would get rid of the uh, unsustainability of magnesium. So yeah, that uh, pretty much sums everything up that I've been working on. I'd like to uh, thank you all for listening to me today. I'd like to particularly thank the Jay Research Group for letting me work with them for the last uh, semester. And uh, in particular, Stephen, who's sitting right here. Uh, he's my postdoc mentor. I've been working directly with him and then also the NSF. So thank you. And then I'll open it up for questions. I have a question. Sure. Um, what's the efficiency, I mean, exactly of the right. whole? So that's a, a pretty difficult question. I don't know is the, the answer straight up. Uh, just looking at this, to know the efficiency, we have to measure, you know, compare it to the old process, go through each step, more or less, and uh, determine the energy output per amount of product or energy you put per amount of product that you make, and uh, really that's beyond the scope of my research. Uh, but you can, I can estimate that uh, comparatively with, to the older process, it's been better. Because the older process, um, you use the magnesium? Um, no, okay. I don't believe so. So essentially, um, the first uh, step involves this reduction from silica just to pure silica, which is then, uh, there's two methods actually I didn't really go into. There's bottom-up and top-down approaches. And uh, what those are is the bottom-up essentially involves taking your silica and then depositing it from the, you actually heat it up until it's the gaseous phase and depositing it into, um, depositing the metal oxide more or less out of the vapor phase. That involves high temperatures and really limits the amount of stuff that can make. And then the, uh, the top down involves like, the milling of pulverization of bulk <coughs> of material. And that pretty much uh, limits, it introduces defects into the product. Uh, so that approach is a little different from that. They both have their uh, drawbacks, I guess I could say. And for the output, you said that uh, this new process is more I don't really know how much you can make from the old process. I just know that you can't make a lot. Yeah. I know that we start with about, uh, I can start with, let's say, one gram of magnesium and uh, a half gram or so of silica and a quarter gram of the metal oxide and then go to about a, a gram or so of product. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty big, a gram doesn't sound like much, but that's a pretty big number when you're working with nanomaterials because they're so tiny. What's been one of the like, biggest challenges and how have you overcome that in your research? So, um, I'll go back to here. I talked a little bit about 
about how um, when we did the reaction, if I look at actually this slide, hello, uh, the reaction, the theorized reaction involved metal silicide, silica, magnesium, as I'm sure a lot of you have done in general chemistry, balance it out, put the amount in that you think you need, and then go. And however, that gives us a mixture of products. And that mixture, we only are interested in one from a technological aspect. So uh, really, the problem with these materials, one of the things that makes them useful is they're really, really inert. But because they're really, really inert, it's hard, you can't separate them from each other when they're in this just like chunk of material. Uh, so the, the really, the meat and bones of the project, you can say for me, has been doing just many, many, many reactions and like changing a little bit, and then seeing if I get a better product, and then like trying to think like, okay, if this made a better product, a more pure product, how can we keep going on with this and then uh, optimize, essentially. That just reminds me that how do you do with other byproducts? Do you recycle all? Other byproducts. Yeah. So, uh, like, these two. Um, so, um, we're essentially just washing the color of the ingredient and then wash them away. Like, I don't, I don't really know exactly uh, the effects, but most of the byproducts are just salt, more or less. So, um, and then this actually, when we add acid, kind of burns out. research that had more 
immediate effects on the community. Um, and we just thought that this would be the best way to sort of figure out exactly how we can attract more vendors and really apply it specifically to this market. So, like, I guess when looking at research, this might not be generalizable to other markets because it's very focused in the South Madison area, but we thought it would be like the best way to create immediate change in the area. All right, so we became familiar with the South Madison Farmers Market and the South Madison community. Uh, by visiting the market, this is us at the South Madison Farmers Market at the Labor Temple. Um, we also visited the Celebrate South Madison Festival um, in South Madison, also at the Labor Temple. Uh, and we also, as Jasmine mentioned, learned about various aspects of community-based research. Um, to conduct the research, we developed a list of questions that we would use um, in focus group discussions. Uh, the initial questions were identified by Robert and Shelley Pierce, as well as other leaders of the South Madison Farmers Market. And then uh, we developed those questions and submitted them to the uh, university's institutional review board. Um, the vendors were recruited from four different farmers market in Maine, four different farmers markets in Maine County, uh, suggested by Robert Pierce. Um, the participants were reached by a combination of email and phone call, um, and then we invited those uh, vendors to participate in our focus groups that would take place on one of two different days, the 18th of November and the 25th. Um, and these took place at the Slow Food UW Family Dinner Night. Uh, the dinner was included in the compensation as well as $35. Um, additionally, Slow Food is consistently reaching out to local farmers, um, so this was an opportunity for both of them to build a partnership. Um, the focus groups were held after the dinner at the crossing where the um, dinner was held. Uh, three students moderated each focus group. One student was the facilitator, there was an assistant facilitator, and a notator. Um, each group, each focus group discussion had about six to eight participants and lasted uh, 60 to 90 minutes. We split the groups up randomly, um, giving no specific attention to uh, race, gender, and like what market they sold in or where they sold or what they sold. Um, and we recorded each group and then transcribed them later. Uh, from these transcriptions, we did coding of each transcription based on a list of codes that were um, from our, this, uh, our original questions. Uh, and then we used these transcriptions to um, provide a um, final report for Robert. Um, so after our research project, um, let's see, our, I'm going to talk about the main results we found from our research, and we kind of split this into three different categories, which was um, the motivations for vending, customer relationships, and knowledge and advice pertaining to the South Madison Farmers Market. And so in this first section, um, motivations for vending, we talked about people's motivation to vend in the first place and also um, what made them pick certain markets over others. And what we found is economics was basically the main incentive for people. Um, they needed to be at a place where they could make money, so having a reliable customer base was something we heard frequently. Um, also, we talked a lot about um, relationships with other vendors and with customers, that was really important to them. They wanted to feel like they're part of the community um, and things like that. It was also important for them to be at a place with a lot of product diversity and without a lot of competition in their specific area so they could be more economically profitable. Um, other than that, location is important. Uh, they want, vendors want a place where people can like pass by and stop in and attract more people that way. Also amenities like parking, bathrooms, things like that are very important. And other people mentioned things like, um, you know, making sure that they're actually providing a service for the community is a really big motivator. They like being a part of them. And 
So a customer vendor relationship occurs when there's an association between two groups while there's a transaction being made. So you go to the vendor's market, you buy vegetables or fruits and with cash and they give you those. But what we wanted to find out also was what was the value of that and what did the how did the customer and vendor each view their relationship to one another? So we wanted to know the different kinds of benefits that they gave, that they thought were important that they got out of this relationship. So we thought that uh, a, a strong customer vendor relationship has the potential to give value to a market because that's ultimately what's going to keep a market going and staying in business. So in our discussions with the vendors, we found several similarities across focus groups. And first of all, vendors emphasize how much they value their customer base. They use words like friend and community to describe the nature of the relationship. So not only are there huge benefits to building a strong customer vendor relationship based on um, just money transaction and getting your produce, but we found that vendors also uh, value the interaction they have with customers, not just um, so they, yeah, so just talking and mingling and hanging out and um, being comfortable in the atmosphere. And so another thing that they really liked was the feedback that they got from customers. So customers would oftentimes uh, suggest, hey, you should sell this next year, or you can't really find this product. Is there a way maybe next year you can incorporate it into your, uh, the things that you sell? And so vendors will consider that feedback. Because if one year everyone really wants cherry tomatoes, they're going to try to cater to that. And so, um, let's see. And then in turn, vendors share knowledge with the customers. They educate them. They talk to them about products, teach them about products that they might be unfamiliar with. Um, even provide recipes. And so in that, customers do also gain a lot from the vendors themselves. And so even if that relationship isn't a permanent one, such as a student coming by once a month, we still think that there is value to that interaction, just because potentially that encourages the student to come back more often because they had a positive um, interaction. And so vendors want customers to come back. They want repeat, uh, custom, repeat customers and loyal customers <coughs> if they can get them. And they have different strategies going about that and several of them are uh, providing samples. And for some, they said it wasn't economically feasible for them to provide these samples, but when they could, they would do it. Just for example, uh, one of the vendors sold goat cheese, and a lot of people haven't had that. So if she could do it, she would give them samples and they can try that out and um, get an idea of what that is. And so customers are a very big factor in what makes a market successful overall and what makes the vendor successful. Vendors want to track those customers. They want to assure to the customers they're committed to them. And they want their customers to be able to rely on them, to be there every weekend. And so in trying to um, gain customers who remain loyal or just in, have this positive interaction, you want to have a strong customer vendor relationship. And so that's one thing that, a couple things that we found. Um, the next aspect we looked into is uh, what kind of knowledge do these vendors already have about the South Madison Farmers Market and then using their feedback to create suggestions uh, for future for South Madison Farmers Market. So we kind of found that all the vendors have like a, there's a wide array of knowledge. Some of them really didn't know anything about the South Madison Farmers Market. Some of them knew a little bit but had like confusion and some of them actually had there themselves. Um, we found among the ones that really like only knew a little, there was confusion over like location and what time the markets are held at. Um, we also found a common agreement among, among the vendors that there was this, this uh, kind of agreement that because of the demographic of South Madison, uh, the vendors thought that you know, they, it wouldn't be possible for them to spend at that market. So, um, you know, because of financial constraints or because of like a low demand for a specific product, that was one of the reasons why some of the vendors either didn't look into it or then they decided to stop vending. Um, we also uh, used the information we received from the focus groups to create suggestions. A more obvious recommendation included like upping the marketing via signage and social media, um, and also 
practice. Um, vendors also recommended that there be fewer markets during the week, kind of just so like you consolidate all of the customers at a given time and place, and hopefully that would um, encourage vendors to um, stick with the sub mass and farmers market because of the profitability at a given time, and also make it easier for them to make that time commitment. Um, one vendor described it as like a chicken and egg situation. So if you don't have the vendors, it's hard to get the customers. And if you don't have the customers, it's hard to get the vendors. So that was like a major problem um, that you are kind of trying to figure out to solve. Um, another vendor said uh, the market can't be all things to all people. They need to take things one step at a time and find one location, one day a week, one block at a time, just take things one step at a time, at a time for improvement. Um, kind of like Mike who said, there's also an appeal to uh, making the market kind of more of a destination that the customers can come and hang out and like feel like it's a place that the community um, can gather and form relationships as opposed to just like going to a place to buy groceries. So place making is very important to the vendors. Um, when the customers see the market as a gathering place, they're more drawn to that experience of forming group relationships and they're more likely to stay for a longer period of time. So um, to help make it more of a destination, they suggested uh, incorporating school events or like having live music play, um, offering free food samples, things that would bring in community members. Um, anything with kids is really interesting. <coughs> brings in parents and grandparents and friends and family members. Um, one vendor said if kids get invited and participate and take an interest and put their hands in the dirt, that could change everything. That could change the culture. Uh, there are also many suggestions on how to manage a market. A good market manager is enthusiastic and understanding and friendly and wants to get to know the community and also wants the vendors to uh, participate in all aspects of decision making. So these vendors suggested that rather than having one market manager, there be some sort of like a, a board uh, to collaborate and you know whether that be vendors or community members also on this board to give their suggestions, they felt like that would be really helpful. Uh, in general, the vendors were really impressed with Robert Pierce's goal to provide South Madison with safe, affordable, healthy food. Um, so they suggested just to like have a board of managers help him with whatever his visions are, that would be helpful. Um, another vendor said the biggest problem with all of this Southside market is that it's run by one person. So it takes more than one person to run a business and to organize. And when you got too many kettles on the stove, something's going to burn, something's going to get. So um, that was just a common theme we heard throughout that last portion of our focus group discussions that you know, for a successful market, there needs to be collaboration. And so hopefully that provided you guys a good overview and we'd like to terminology when you were working with your focus group. So on campus we say food desert and we say food justice. So what when you say those things to them, what you know what how does that translate or what what are some words that they might use, some terms that they might use that to describe those? 
Did you run into that at all? That's a really good question um, because different people do use different terminology. So we tried to use words that like were applicable to everyone and mm -hmm. like we didn't want to say anything that was like biased or would push judgments on mm -hmm. or like make them answer like in a certain way. So um, I think in general we did a pretty good job of staying away from those kinds of From jargon? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. see this area as a perceived desert. Now, obviously, we all know deserts don't mean lack of life. It just means an area that's more barren than that. This is a term uh, brought in 2007 by Murray Gallagher down in Chicago. And it's been morphed here and there, um, but it's something that has now caught on, per se. But I think, especially when we talk to the customers or the residents of the area, as Cynthia pointed out this semester, not using such terms is probably the best way to go because that's again, implying our or someone else's viewpoint upon that community not being inclusive of what we're trying to do as a community uh, group of students going down and listening to their opinions. And we also learned that like part of being a facilitator at a focus group is like avoiding those kinds of terms. So we just like ask very like general questions and let them talk to us about what was going on in their heads. So that's kind of part of what like focus group is. Great, thanks. I just wanted to ask, so I mean, you came up with sort of a lot of different possibilities, but what would you really conclude that um, would need to be done to really make the South Madison farmer's market more viable? What would be your recommendation to be? I mean, I think the board of directors part is That's one thing that this semester we're still working to sort of push Robert in that direction to sort of get more assistance with his market because he is just trying to tackle so many different things at once. Um, but I think that brings up like just the hard part of working with a community partner is they might not really like all of your recommendations um, and it's just hard to so you're hinting at the fact that Robert doesn't like the idea of the board. Is that the idea? Um, okay, Raleigh, you're. you're <laughs> I, I, would, I would say I would say that it's it's a known type of uh, organization in other markets. Uh, in the inception of the Southside Farmers Market ten years ago, there was a group from the community that did organize the different ideas. That has lapsed since about ten years ago, but. It's not that the idea can't come up again and it can't be implemented, it's just getting that core group of people that hopefully we find this semester that would want to sit on that board and add their input. So it's, it's actually it's, finding the people who the commit. identification of the community members that would have the best interest of the whole community and not just their specific interest as a farmer, as a vendor, as a school teacher, or whatever it may be. It's, it's getting that group together is the top uh, task. Okay, thank you. Uh, you talked a little bit about marketing, and I was just wondering what the market is doing right now, and like what their outlet is. They've got, I mean, I, I think they have like a Twitter and a Facebook page, but it's not very active, um, so they can definitely improve on that. I think the biggest barrier, if you don't mind me adding, um, is signage. Mm -hmm. Getting approved through the city, a certain size piece of paper or a piece of wood or a banner that can sit day before and day after markets so people know when it is, where it is, and how they can access it. So if they're driving by on a Tuesday, they know Wednesday, I better pull over if I want food from this market. You know, uh, 
this side does that well. They have to sign up on a telephone pole. There's different regulations. Some of the south side is actually the town of Madison instead of the city of Madison. And some of it goes into Fitchburg. There's actually, you know, there's multiple municipalities that have to give um, both private and public the, the go ahead for such. So that's been an issue, I think, over the past couple of years. Um, something that would be a great start at the point. Are there any specific initiatives from the, the city or government or whatever to try to promote uh, the sustaining of those, those markets that are having a harder time or location in a food desert or anything like that? Um, yeah, there are actually grants available to the city. S-E-E-D. C-E-E-D. C-E-E-D. I mean, it's an acronym for something that spells something wonderful like lunch hour. Right. <laughs> um, and I know we're currently, a lot of people on campus are currently applying for one of those grants that the South Madison farmer's market is involved with to some capacity. I'm not really sure of the specifics, but um, yeah, we are working on that. And the Madison, or the city of Madison does have grants available focused on um, increasing food access. And I think a big part of it was um, child health. Really, it's like a big component of those seed grants. So I think focusing on like the um, child food security and combating child obesity and other diseases is one of the reasons why they have those grants available right now. And that one in particular, the city might function too, is it's brand new. There's a lot of newer local initiatives and funding opportunities, but uh, to wrap in something national, it has to be a multi-site kind of initiative, just won't be for one side of a specific town and this kind of thing, so. And in addition to that, there's also like the food vouchers, like the double food dollar type things where people who have like the food vouchers can go to the farmer's market, buy food, and then they get like double dollars to spend at the market. So that's, that's I think it's fairly new. Yeah, it was a pilot project, and specifically uh, on the design for South Mason Farmers Market, North Side, and there's one on the East, East Side. So yeah, this is a brand new program, pilot program, and I don't think we know yet whether they will do it again this summer. Yeah, it was, yeah the money was put up by two uh, hospitals or uh, healthcare facilities in Madison, I think up to $10,000, to match those double dollars or whipped in the minimum stamp bonus. Um, now bringing the numbers from this past year on how long. Okay. Just to be respectful of our time, I'm so yeah. put out here. Definitely very interesting. Thank you guys.
possibly a biodegradable package, cardboard box, maybe, we're not really sure yet. Um, the idea came up of a uh, biodegradable package with a seed, so you can just toss it and then you're planting a seed at the same time with like base, would be really cool. And the resources that you're using for transportation are way less, because instead of shipping a normal 12 pack, you're looking at a smaller package about a bag. So, like, there's no weight in the truck hardly. Um, water is the main weight. And so, you're also using local water, which fights water privatization, which is another major issue currently. And so, instead of shipping water in from who knows where, you can just use your local tap water, filtered, and then it's ready to use. So that's another pro of the biofuel. So the carbonation. The carbonation is probably the main research right the now. Biggest challenge with products um, by far. We're still currently trying to come up with ideas and do more research as to what um, methods we're going to test. Um, our focus currently has been uh, applying to the ag price. We haven't really been able to start testing some of these ideas. Um, but effervescent um, products have given us some inspiration. Um, we, may not, we may not be able to match the exact like carbonation of, say, like a Pepsi or Coke, like a real soda product. Um, but if we can get something comparable in terms of how fizzy it is or a similar taste that it would replace it, um, it would still be a major improvement and it would be um, beneficial. We tried um, using dry ice, but the problem was that the CO2 wouldn't be really contained in the bottle or the cup, so that was a downfall. But that's okay. That's why you do research. And beyond the fact of not being able to actually carbonate dry ice has a lot of negative side effects, and there are many more problems there. And so the container. Um, so the bio cube, depending on what it's made of, it may have a single serve like holster. So Bath and Body Works has those. Uh, hand sanitizer like clippies that you put on your backpack. And so we're looking at maybe doing the same idea with your bio cube and making it more of a trend. So, oh, hey, what flavor do you got today? Or what's in your like, pack? And so it'd be really cool. Like, we're aiming at a college market to, to start out. So that's a great way to get going. And so the next thing is flavoring. Um, we have some ideas for flavoring, starting out with some sparkling water products or possibly a few natural um, flavors, maybe like orange, apple, that kind of thing. And then we are also looking at incorporating the soft drink industry as well as teas and leading up to juices, which would be really cool. But we have to do more research as well. And so the global impact, um, the biggest thing that is going to be affected is the transportation of the product, like the water as well. Um, the packaging is going to have sustainable awareness on it, so that's a plus. They will be available in single serve, 6 and 12. To be determined. To be determined. But that's what we're looking at. So you can do the 1% for the planet little sticker, like on the clip bars. That would be really cool. And then the waste reduction. Um, you would get rid of the plastic disposable bottles as long as people have their own cup or plate bottle. And so it may increase the use of bottled water, which would be not the purpose, and that would be really disappointing. So we have to look at a way to address that issue right off, right, like right away. And then it's a modernization of the beverage industry, for sure. Um, so the individual benefits, what are you going to get from the BioCube? You're going to get an awareness of your environmental impacts and how you're helping the planet, as well as a healthy alternative. So instead of drinking that soft drink, you're like, hey, I can make my own cube today and use these all natural products. And then it's also going to be a cheaper alternative. We're looking at a third of the cost. So your soft drink right now will probably cost like $1.50. And we're looking at 49 cents for a single serve. So why not? And in summary, we believe that the BioCube can change the world by reducing the amount of waste generated in their everyday lives, along with a further education about sustainability and its importance in today's society. And then our wrap-up phase, just drop this drink for planet Earth. And with that, we'll open up to questions. What's your game plan going forward if you do
do when the egg fries and you don't when the egg fries. <laughs> so the product idea came out with the Wisconsin Lakes Sustainability Flex that all our sponsors. So um, if we don't win, we'll start there. We are going to continue with the research for the rest of the semester and then possibly look at alternative funding for the project. And if we do win, we will continue to go work with the project and come up with some awesome carbonation flavor ideas. Hopefully release the product. So it's awesome. Please. Do you think this is something that you're gonna have to like, when you put it in, like shake it or just it dissolves or like, have you thought about it? Uh, the idea that we do, Right now we're looking at effervescence, so the idea is if you think of like alpha seltzer or something like that, where you drop it in and it kind of naturally fizzes by a reaction to water. Um, we have a lot of research yet to do, but our hope is that you won't have to um, actually like seal it and shake it or whatever, because that's that's the main idea of um, some of the other products that we produce. produced. Um, we're trying to make it more convenient while at the same time providing the same taste and same flavor. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to just drop and then like pause and wait for it to fizz and mix and then be able to drink it. You have to like shake around a little bit, but it's nothing more than your usual like single serve crystal light or off the top like shake in. So same idea, just a little different. You mentioned working with other companies for flavoring. Um, do you have any specific companies in mind, and how we kind of go, go about reaching out to them? Yep. So there was a company on Kickstarter that uh, they had three different flavors, and they were all natural. And so we would depending on our funding and how much research we're getting done would possibly partner with them. And then another alternative is that the idea would be sold to a major market or major beverage like Coca-Cola or Pepsi, which is the final straw. So if it doesn't go anywhere, that would be an option. Do you have any initial ideas of how you
but then in the next weeks we'll really do a lot more market research and really kind of try to hone in on those, those characteristics that we need for our firm.